I have enough problems maintaining one life. I want to start off with a verse of scripture which has become important uh, based on a number of circumstances which take place in our environment, in our culture, and it's one for you to kind of tuck in your back pocket because you will need this at certain times in your life. It's Romans chapter 5, verse 4, four just sorry, no, I was going to say 14, Romans 15, verse 4, sorry. And this is what it says. It says, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for your instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. One of the most amazing things about our faith, personally knowing Jesus, is this thing which we call hope. And based on the message material this morning, I want to preface this whole message, everything that I say after this will be based on the foundation of that scripture that there is always hope. That's the wonderful thing. In the midst of a pandemic, if you know Jesus, you have hope. In the midst of persecution, we serve a God of hope. In the midst of despair, we serve a God of hope. In your greatest time of need, there will always be a God of hope that will be there. Whatever tragedy, whatever crisis you may have been going, no hard or no difficult it is, we serve a God of hope. In the midst of oppression, in the midst of bondage, we serve a God of... Ah, okay, good. So I still have your attention at this particular point. And that becomes important. And you may say, well, Pastor Mike, there's, hope is not really a 800-pound gorilla. It's not one of those things that we kind of have to, we never really talk about. But it is something which is absolutely necessary when we begin to talk about the 800-pound gorilla of the spiral downward effect of what I will call sexual idolatry pornography, whatever we want to do. Because it's an 800-pound gorilla because of its pervasiveness, its effect, its paralyzing effect, particularly amongst our men. And the secrecy, the fact that it lingers behind the scenes. And, and this isn't popular preaching. But I think it's something which is important to talk about in a congregation. Because it is huge. So let me just tell you this right off the start. I am not going to be able to inform you fully of all the things that are there. Even in my message, I don't know. I think I got through two-thirds of it uh, in the first session. There's just so much to say, and, and I'm realizing I can't really say everything, and I'm not going to present you something which is going to have an instinct healing. Is There's no magic pill to this. But what I can do is I can give you the ingredients. I can equip you. What I can do is I can provide you with a formula that will help you in deliverance and help for those people uh, for whom this is directed. And this probably is not what I would call a shotgun sermon. It might be a rifle sermon. But as I look at the statistics and I look at uh, all the involvement in it, that is probably more pervasive than what we would care to um, believe. Now, there's a bunch of resources Someone says, hey, what are the best resources on the issue of sexual idolatry? Um, well, every resource that you can get your, a hold on is probably a good resource. Um, but Ted Roberts' Pure Desire has, is a good one. Steve Otterburn's uh, book, Every Man's Battle, has always been a good one. Uh, right now, media has some fantastic stuff. And if you don't have access to, to right now media, make sure that you get... Uh, uh, we get your email and we will invite you to become part of that. There's a number of studies, there are a number of seminars, there are a number of children's materials, there's a whole bunch of stuff. But there is one particular section which has some really good stuff. And one is by a fellow named Steve Gallagher. He has two really good things on there. The first one is 20 Truths That Helped Me in My Battle with Porn Addiction. And that's not just for people who are battling in that area. It is in any area that you battle in. And it's worth, it's worth the watch. Uh, the other one is a book that he wrote. It's called at the altar of sexual idolatry kind of goes through the whole uh, portion. I'm hoping within the next year to perhaps have a, a small group that will go through that whole process. May even take a year uh, to do. Brett Allman, uh, I'm hoping maybe to have Brett 
um, share in part of this series if we can get a live simulcast of him because he has so many good materials. But the Porn Project, that's on right now, media. Um, Covenant Eyes uh, is one thing uh, that that we have a community. It is a an online accountability uh, group, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. But Covenant Eyes has a number of great ebooks. Uh, one has to do with st- the statistics on porn. Your your uh, the your brain on porn. It has uh, it has materials for people who are struggling in their marriage. It has materials for women who are struggling in this area. It has materials on. Um, parents who want to porn-proof their home, and they've got a number of ideas and things which are there. Now, now I, I printed out a couple of just hard copies on the table as you leave, but if you have your computer, uh, if you have a computer where you can download these things, uh, email the church, find out what the title is, email the church, and we will, uh, we will send you those things if you want. Covenant Eyes was kind enough to allow us um, to do that. I have uh, Covenant Eyes on all of my computers, all of my laptops, all of my tablets. And there's a reason for that. Uh, 20 some odd years ago, uh, Ted Ladke and Marilyn Ladke had a uh, computer store called Galaxy Computers. They came to the church here and, and he said, Mike, I want to get you a computer. And, and when that had taken place, I thought, one of the most wonderful things to have is a computer. And then I also, it didn't take me long at all to realize one of the most dangerous things that I can have is a computer. Because all of a sudden I realized that there was temptations which are there that I had to be aware of. And as I began to read one or two articles, one article was talking about those people who are particularly susceptible to this particular thing are people who have had abuse in their lives and people who have had bad relationships or hard relationships with their father and, and people where addiction is abundant in their family and, 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 and positions and jobs where they spend lots of time on the computer. And it went on and on and all of a sudden I found myself putting a check mark beside absolutely every one of them that was there. So I sat there and said, I've got to get this on here. This is something which is important to me. And so it becomes part of every single part because I take seriously the fact that I have to fight to stay pure. And if I have to fight to stay pure, I'm sure that you have to fight to stay pure. We live in a sexualized society. And we need to do everything we possibly can as individuals and as a community to stay pure. Amen? Is that not true? Or am I the only one who's kind of thinking these things? This is something which is of utmost importance. So I have two accountability partners who talk to me regularly and they ask me pointed questions. And Covenant Eyes will send them a copy of every website that I have visited. Not only that, they will have screenshots that will eventually go to them every once in a while so that, so that if there's anything that is inappropriate, I'm going to be getting a phone call. And so I'm coming to you um, this morning. Not as a person who is... Um, way up there, you know, telling you how to live down there. Far from it. I'm talking as a person who believes that we all need to do our best that we possibly can to stay pure. And we all need to work as a community to somehow make a difference. And to do that, we need to become real with our temptations. Like Steve Otterburn said in his book, it really is every man's battle and it goes beyond that. So there's a statement that I always make as I go through and as I talk with other people. And this is the statement that I make that helps me stay online. And it's this. I have enough problems maintaining one life. I don't want to be maintaining a double life because that's what happens when we get overwhelmed in this particular area because it's pervasive isn't it like when I was a child if if I were ever to be exposed by pornography or if I ever wanted to to somehow find some what would happen is maybe there would be a friend whose father had had some kind of stash somewhere either that or what I would have to do is go into the corner store and wait for the the cashier to be distracted doing something else, and I would have to reach up to some kind of high level uh, to try and reach a magazine, somehow get a picture of a naked lady. And that's what the extent was for me. But for our children, and for our grandchildren, 
At the touch of a button, they have instant access to lewdness in the most profane, graphic, violent, pornographic images and videos that was ever available. And heck, you don't even have to leave your home. You don't even have to leave your room. So let's talk about this. For the first time in all of history, this is the first time when the fantasy has become more popular than the reality. Came across this quote by Playboy writer Damon Brown. It says this, it seems so obvious. If we want to invent a machine, the first thing we, we are going to do after making a profit is to use it to watch porn. In the last 150 years, pornography has ridden on the heels of new technology from the photograph to the film projector, from the VHS to DVDs, from the World Wide Web to smartphones, you name it. Pornography planted its big flag there first, or at least shortly thereafter. The top 100 uh, porn sites which are visited, of, of all of them that they measure, are pornographic. Uh, five of them of the 100. And of those five, they receive six billion visits a month. Yes, I said that right. I'll double check it. Yes, six billion visit, visits a month. In, in 2015, humanity spent four billion hours on porn. Isn't that incredible if you stop and consist it? And if, that is just, if that's just with five websites, there are over four million websites dedicated to this. The number one site, which is called Pornhub, which is out of Montreal, unfortunately, gets 81 million hits a day. That's four million an hour, 56,000 a minute. In the time I finish this message, over two million people will have visited their site. The greatest anomaly as you take a look at this over the last 10 to 20 years is the increase that women get addicted to porn. Again, Pornhub, as they had put out their 2017 statistics, basically said that the number of people that, uh, that view their sites, 75% are men, 25% are women. And the problem is, is that most time when women engage in this, they will never even tell their best friend. And many times as they go through recovery, they think that they're the only ones that are involved. And other statistics that I have read and haven't, wasn't able to substantiate is that, is that women many times are like up to five times more likely to act out some of the things that they have seen. And so the, the, the level of damage is even higher. Children in porn. Can I just give you a couple of these statistics? Is it okay if I, if I do this? The Justice Department estimates that 9 out of 10 children between the ages of 8 and 16 have been exposed to pornography online. The software company Semantic found that 47% of school-aged children receive pornographic spam on a daily basis. Representatives of the porn industry told the Congress on, of Online Protection Act Commission that as much to tw as 20 to 30% of traffic to some pornographic websites is children. Is that not incredible? If you stop and consider all of those things. Someone said, Barnes, who's a reputable research person, says that up to two-thirds of men who identify themselves as Christians view porn. And of them, up to 75% feel that it's harmless. Wives of husbands who are addicts have are 70% uh, meet most of the criteria of a person who has post-traumatic stress disorder. Barner goes on to say that 44% of 13 to 17 year olds have sent a nude image. 69% of those 18 to 24 year olds have done the same. Can't even get into the statistics on porn in the workplace or the sex industry that is involved in it. The, the fact that, that there's a huge struggle within the church and the fact that the, the statistics for non-Christian people and, and those who are part of the church is almost negligible. And the fact that many of our leaders are being subject to the, the exact same thing. There was a, there was a, a, program on Netflix which was talking about recruiting those who are 18 years old and one of the, one of the people who, who recruited them said this I will never run out of 18 year old girls what a sad thing if you stop and consider and, and I'm not even giving you near the ones the, the, some of the most shocking um, things uh, which um, I will let you kind of look on, on your own here's a, a statement that was made 
Porn is an equal opportunity destroyer. Porn doesn't have a demographic. It crosses all demographics. If I go on from there, I know that I'm not a doctor and I certainly am not an authority, but as I began to read, began to realize that there's a physiological effect, that there are certain neurochemicals and hormones that are released when a person is extensively watching pornography, that there's a dopamine or something which which is released that causes the external high. But after increased uh, exposure to it, the brain eventually fatigues and limits the release of the dopamine. and, And then what happens is the viewer... Wanting more is unable to reach that level of satisfaction. So what they do is they go into higher levels and they go into to harder pornography to get the same arousal. And, and at the same time, there are certain triggers that would cause people to look and see or go towards that. And at the beginning, they're small, but as you watch more and more of this, what happens is there are more and more triggers, and so you have more temptation to go there. And once you do go there, you don't have the satisfaction that you used to have before, and then you just begin to take chances. It just goes deeper. It just goes down darker as as you, you look at all of the things. And that's why Proverbs chapter 31 which is kind of what we have, if you're just kind of joining us, it's kind of where we are onwards. We're talking about 800-pound gorillas. One of the things that the king's mother says to Lemuel, who is, who is God's anointed one, and we are God's anointed one, he said, listen, my son, listen, son of my womb, listen, my son, the answer to my prayers, don't spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. And basically what she's talking about and talking to Solomon about is the lust of the eyes. The allure of sexual addiction that has wreaked society at that particular time and in ours today. And you stop and think, as Solomon had 700 wives, 300 concubines, I think he kind of failed the test. Don't know, doesn't say that. But what it does say is that Abraham, or sorry, Solomon's wives turned his heart away from God. He may have lost his soul to this very thing. And I ask myself, isn't he the wisest man in the world? How is it that the wisest man in history falls to something like that? Maybe in our wisdom we think that we have it all together. We kind of think that we can hold on to it, but perhaps not. You take a look at Proverbs, the first seven chapters, and a lot of it has to do with this very thing that we're talking about today. I took... Proverbs chapter 7, verses 24 to 7, and it substitute the word prostitute with pornography. This is what it says. Listen to me, young man, and not only listen, but obey. Uh, Don't give your desires, uh, get out of hand. Don't let yourself think about pornography. Don't go near it. Stay away from where it is, lest it tempt you and seduce you. For it has been the ruin of multitudes. A vast host of men have been pornography's victims. If you want to find the road to hell, look for her house. And we don't have to look very far, do we? Stop and consider people who we know whose lives have been ruined, marriages that have been ruined, even children who have grown up to be addicts. And and we say, hey, it's not too far. What what is what good or what harm does porn do? Well, it does a lot. It devalues human lives. It desensitizes us, sensitizes us to sin. It detaches us from God. It distances us uh, from God and others. It detours God's plan, his destiny, his anointing in our life. It, it degrades our spouses. It denies true intimacy. As a matter of fact, it counterfeits true intimacy. What else does it does? It it directs us to more degrading actions. It deepens emotional problems. It develops an unrealistic expectation. It deepens the neural pathways of addiction. It deadens our soul. It's a downward spiral. And it disregards God's plan for sexuality in our lives and just leads to that lowest level. Like there's a process. I don't know if you've ever realized that there is a, a process To porn, it kind of starts off with the seduction. That's kind of why James says, when lust is conceived, it brings forth to sin. Then from there, the secrecy begins. And after a while, the shame begins to overwhelm us as we become enveloped by it. And there's a a struggle or a subtle strangulation 
what happens is it slowly begins to, to squeeze the life out of us. And, and as much as we try, all of a sudden we say, I, I just can't get out. It's hopeless. And what happens is that so much becomes part of our lives that we begin to silence and separate ourselves and sorrow becomes the, the main thing and slavery comes because we become a slave to God eventually gives us over to the, the aspect of, of pornography. It's such a difficult thing. And so what, what I wanted to do, if I could, I wanted to talk about hope. I wanted to talk about the way out to perhaps one or two who might be here tonight this, or this morning. This might be something where God is speaking to you and allowing you to have freedom. There's three steps. And these three steps are not just um, for someone who is going through this type of a bondage, but I would say it is for every type of bondage. But I would also say this, this is probably the biggest, most pervasive bondage that the, first, the, the, the church and the world is even uh, facing. So what's the first step? The first step is what I will call confession and exposure. Is that if you're going to have any kind of relief, you need to let the cat out of the bag. You have to have God see it and deal with it. You know, since the very beginning, dealing with sin has always been the same. Take a look at Adam and Eve. What happens when Adam sins? God goes to visit him, and what is he doing? He's covering himself up. He is hiding it. He is blaming his wife. He is blaming God. He is ashamed of what is taking place. The same thing happens, because that's what happens, and that's what we want to do naturally, when all of a sudden something like this happens in our lives. I don't want anybody to know. Nobody needs to know. But John chapter 3 kind of says something about that. You know the passage where John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, three verses later, it just goes on and it talks about this. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that they may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Sin operates in darkness. And so if you expose it, there is no chance for it to take place. Psalm chapter 1, uh, 145, 18 basically says, The Lord will draw all near to all who call on him. Who call on him, it says this, in truth. In Psalm chapter 32, when David is going through the situation that he is uh, with Bathsheba and he's covered up the sin, this psalm represents that. And it says, then I acknowledge my sin to you. You do not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgive the guilt of my sin. That Before that, it basically says, it was so heavy. Things were so heavy upon me. It was, it was like a huge weight, like the middle, of the middle of the day sun upon me. That's why, son, that's why David says, surely you decided truth in the inmost parts. That's where it matters. And if you allow confession and if you allow exposure to take place, a number of things happen. You allow God to work and to heal. You release the fear. It takes the gun out of the devil's hands, doesn't it? Hey, I know what's going on. You know what's going on. You don't want anybody to know. But I'm just telling you that it could probably happen. You know what's going to happen if it happens. And people are going to find out what happened. What happens if all of a sudden everyone does know? What happens if you're the one who does the exposing? You take the gun from the devil's hand. You allow other people to help you. It takes you out of isolation. It takes you out of prison. I remember as I was reading Francis Frangia Payne's book, Holiness, uh, Truth, in the Presence of God, he made a statement that has stuck with me. He says, you know those times where you almost get caught in a sin? And what you say after that is, oh God, I'm so thank you. God, for, 
God, thank you for not allowing me to be caught in this sin. He says, you know what? It probably wasn't God. It was probably the devil that kept you from being caught. Because things only get right in the light. Don't they? Isn't that, isn't that true? That's the first step. What's the second step? The second step is just as important. It's basically um, the idea of authentic community and connection. And I could have just said uh, co- uh, community and connection. But you need that word authentic there, don't you find? I think, I think we're kind of past the, the aspect of uh, superficial. It just doesn't seem to cut it. I hate fake connection, don't you? It's the time we became really connected. That's why James says, confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another so that you might be healed. See, we take that passage of scripture and we say, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails us, avails much, which is what the scripture says. But we always think of that as, hey, we need to pray because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Not even considering that the context of that whole passage is that we need to confess our faults one to another so that we might be healed. That's what that whole passage is about. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens and if you do that, you will be fulfilling the law of Christ. Proverbs 27 verse 17. Iron sharpens iron. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 2. You know that passage. Hey, if you're by yourself, you're going to get kind of killed. But two people can defend themselves. And then it says, a rope that has three cords is really hard to break. The fact that there is connection that is needed. I believe this. I believe that there are certain things that happen in our lives and things that we will go through where we will not be free if we try by ourselves. There are certain things, there are certain bondages, there are certain crises, there are certain things that happen where you are actually going to need somebody else to help you. For some of us, the biggest problem is not the addiction. The biggest problem is the pride that says, I can do it myself. And so we never ever get the help that we need. Amen. I hate this. It's kind of quiet in here today. (laughs) Anyways. There's a third one. This third one is important. The third one... I call this desperation, perspiration, perseverance. Because to confess and expose, that happens right away. Like it's just the first initial thing. It's just, you know, you, the second one, the community and the connection. Sometimes it takes a long time, a couple of months, up to maybe a couple of years to find someone or something, some process that will help you. But this third one, Desperation, perspiration, perseverance, it takes a lifetime. It is something that will be always with you, won't it? That's why Paul says right at the end of his ministry, I've fought the good fight. Well, what does that mean? That means he was continually seeking to follow the Lord, and it was a battle. You take a look at Corinthians as he talks in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. He says this. I put my body into submission. There was one verse that says, I beat my body so that I can discipline it so that I can run the race and not be disqualified. He goes on in Philippians and says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul was serious about this. This was was a desperate measure which which was needed. He's stop and consider how difficult it is. That there's, there is some theology which we go by which I think is wrong. One, one theology that we go by which is wrong is this. Is that grace is a trump card over the fear of God. Well, because we're under so much grace and we know that God loves us and know God cares about us and God just loves us so much and it's a wonderful thing. But that doesn't take away from the fact that there are so many passages in Scripture that says we need to fear the Lord and the reason that they are there is because it keeps us straight in line. It causes us to take a serious look at our lifestyle and how we need to pursue God with all of our heart. Another theology which I think we get wrong is what's called the lowest common denominator. What's the lowest common denominator theater? Is just find somebody who is worse than you and then what you are doing won't seem so bad. If someone else in the, in the area of sexual idolatry is a 7 out of 10 and I'm a 1 out of 10, then I'm good for a couple spikes. 
not realizing that that number one will send you to a lost eternity just as much as the person who's on seven. That, that there, is no, there is no lowest common denominator, that we got to give everything to him all the time. How about organic sanctification? Organic sanctification says this. Well, the spiritual man is the default. So eventually if I go and I, and I kind of hang around God, then things will even themselves out. No! It says it's the flesh that is the default. We'll continually fight against the flesh. There's always going to be that fight that we continually battle. And what about the friendship myth? We've kind of had the friendship myth. Well, God wants to be my friend. You know, the ultimate, the ultimate pursuit of God is to make sure that I'm happy. I'm sorry, the friendship, the happiness myth. The ultimate, the ultimate end that God has for me, for me is to be happy. Well, come on. Really? Is that what we think? God will understand. God will understand my pain. God will understand that, that, that my spouse is not doing enough to help me in, in this whole process. God, God, God is going to understand that we live in a culture which is difficult. God's going to understand that there is abuse which is, which is in my life. And the thing is true. God, God is continually calling on us to stay pure. And I can tell you there's a number of people here who are going through difficult situations and there's a lot of reasons why you might be caught in something like this. And you may have failed a number of times and you may have shame levels and frustration levels and and depression levels. But let me just tell you this. Surrendering is not an option because the spiritual implications are way too high. And the scriptures which talk about this are way too hard. The scripture in in Matthew chapter 5 where it says, listen, you need to be careful to the point where if your right eye offends you, you need to pull it out. If your right hand is is offending you, then you need to cut it off. If your foot, where you go, the places, the things that you do, the things that you see, you need to take serious action basically is what it is, is saying. And someone has said to me, well, what about, it's just talking about causes you to stumble. It doesn't have to do with that. Well, no, not really. The Greek word for that word stumble um, is, is um, I think I have it in my notes somewhere here. Come on. Where is it? Ah, scandalizo. Repeat that word after me. Scandalizo. Almost sounds Italian, doesn't it? Scandalizo. What kind of scandalizo is happening here? Scandaliso means to fall away. You take a look at the, um, the parable of the sower and there was that seed that kind of fell upon the stones and, and then when persecution had come up, it said that that person fell away. Scandaliso. Matthew chapter 24 says, in the last days, people will fall away. Scandaliso. Like it's serious. If you take a look at Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1 gives us some real interesting things. In Romans chapter 1 verse 21 it says this, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, their foolish hearts were darkened. Therefore God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity, and they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. You look closely at that passage of scripture. It talks about the process of sin which takes place in a person's life. That It starts with just your relationship with God, with your worship to him. And and then as all of a sudden sin becomes muddled in, it takes away your worship and it takes away your, your gratitude. And it begins to desensitize you and you begin to look another way and you become desensitized to it. You don't think it's as bad as what you thought and, and you become what's called darkened. And then from there, after a while, when you just continue to go down that spiral, what happens is God has no choice but to release you. What happens is you become dark and you begin to believe the lies that Satan begins to talk to you. You see, the more a person sins, the tinier God and his commandments become in his thinking. Eventually we try to cheat ourselves into the belief that sin is not as quite as sinful as what God says it is and that we are not as bad as what we really are. This is kind of the process. This is the danger in it. 
you eventually begin to feel that you're a spiritual guy with a small sin problem. You go to church, you sing the songs, nobody knows the difference, but your heart's far from it. That's why Romans chapter 6 verse 21 says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body. It's serious. You can't just say, ah, oh, it's there. I'm going to let it stay there. No, what happens is there's a downward trajectory which basically says, I am serving God, but really you're not. That's what happens. Don't you dare give up. You always have to fight. You always have to fight. And if it takes me and other people in the church to help, then I am willing to do so. We're willing to establish whatever we possibly can to help whoever is here dealing with this. And I'll say this, every single one of us battle. You can't give up. Did I say you can't give up? Okay, good. Um, I came across a story, a number of testimonies and stories, and there was one that really caught me. One that I thought, wow. Story of an individual who grew up in the church and served Jesus the best he possibly could and then all of a sudden got caught up in, in this, this, this sexual idolatry. He said, I began to watch first irregularly, then regularly, and, and as I, I got more into it, it just became more intense in my life. That all of a sudden I started to begin to take chances. And so what happens is if I was away uh, on a business trip, then I would find my way to, a, to a, an area strip joint where I'm almost positive that nobody would know who I was and I would sit and, and I would watch, sometimes for hours. One particular time, he felt a particular urge to go and, and, and he just went to a neighboring city, sat down, watched this one particular girl dance. Friday night, goes home, doesn't think too much of it. Sunday morning, he's in church. And as he's in church, he sees this same girl that was stripping, worshiping the Lord. Both hands in the air, giving glory to God. And he says, you have got to be kidding me. Can you believe this girl? Obviously, she's under some kind of delusion, thinking that she's serving Jesus when really she's not. And then it hit him. Then all of a sudden, he began to realize how far he had faded and got to a point where he said, okay, God, I got to give it to you. I think that might resonate today. How far have we gone? Is it, are you taking a look at the sign as you drive down the highway that says, last exit before the toll? You see, you see that sign that says, last exit before the toll, and you still drive a little way, then all of a sudden you just get there and it's all of a sudden upon you. Hey, if I could get you to do one thing, and that is to fight to somehow give you some type of a renewed hope that says, you know what, yeah, I can do this. If I have help with someone, if there's a, someone there that could take place, then maybe you could. I want you to fight. I want to fight for your soul. I want you to fight for your marriage. I want you to fight so that you're not opening a gateway to your children because you need to get back to that place where God wants you to be. Amen? Um, William Struthers wrote the book called Wired for Intimacy. It was a great book. He gives this example. He says, he says, we had this pump. It was farm and then we used to go and pump. And you know, for those of us who know, you had that little pump where you kind of pump it up and down and, and all of a sudden water comes out and you, have, and you have this drink of water, fresh water that kind of tastes kind of rocky or something. I didn't like the taste. But anyways, let's, let's not get caught up in that. But after you get the drink of water, what happens? You take it away and there's still water that kind of comes out. He said, this is what is happening at this thing. And so after a while, the stream of water just kept hitting the cement that was on. He said, after a while, there was a big crevice that was in the water that had been eroded by the water. And he said, it was to the point where it was almost two inches thick. And then he began to say, isn't that kind of like the pornography that happens, takes place that 
you know, first it's not too bad, but then all of a sudden the, the hormones and the neurochemicals and all of that there take place and it eventually wears a pathway. And that pathway gets so deep that it's a cavern and it's a cavern so deep that you can't get out yourself. But then he said this, what if, what if you turned the spout? What if you created a new line? Something that was different, not like the one that was before, something that was based on godliness. Then what it would do is it would eventually steer you away from the bondage that you're in. God, I pray for whoever this might be. Um, but I do believe that all of us, I do believe that all of us deal with this battle in the society that we live in. I pray, Father, that somehow in some way this word will project a level of hope that will say, you know what? I'm willing to fight for my soul. I'm willing to fight for this. I can't stay the way it is right now. And, and uh, I don't know, it might be for one, it might be for 30, 40. I, I'm not too sure. But God, I just pray that you bless this church. And I pray, Father, that we'll be able to do everything we can as a church to say, okay, we're going to do everything we can to stay pure. Lord, have your way, Lord, as we close in this last song.